Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Animus Corporation, providing insulin delivery products for people living with diabetes and part of the One Touch family. And by Dexcom. Take control of your diabetes with the world's first continuous glucose monitoring system that sends glucose readings directly to your compatible smart device. Live life on your own terms with Dexcom. Hey, it's Stacy. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, actor Derek Thieler sharing stories of growing up with type 1 and moving to L.A. to pursue his career. He almost lost a big TV role when his blood sugar dropped during the audition. So I hung up on the phone with her and I called the cast director and said, I'm really sorry, I don't want to be the guy with excuses, but I, I have a condition, I'm a diabetic, and I was having a really bad low today, and I definitely wasn't performing my best. And she's like, oh, thank God for telling me. We were so worried about you. We didn't know oh. what was going on. That audition for the show Baby Daddy would be his big break. We talk about that experience and about his newest role as part of the Marvel TV universe. Plus, an insulin price protest making national news and more help for those devastated by this month's two hurricanes. And in our Shop Talk segment, meet the people behind Pump Peels and Connected in Motion. It all starts now on Diabetes Connections. Welcome to another week of the show. I am so glad to have you along. Lots to talk about today, as always. If you're new to the program, I'm really glad you found us. That's great. Here on Diabetes Connections, we aim to educate and inspire about type 1 diabetes through stories of connections from celebrities, athletes, authors, leaders in our community, as well as by talking to the healthcare companies and to the tech folks that help make our lives better. And even if you're not playing a Marvel superhero on TV or biking across the country, you know, just living this everyday life as a person with type 1 or as someone who loves a person with type 1... It is important to have your story told as well. And that's why I'm here. I do not have type 1 myself. My son has type 1 diabetes. He was diagnosed just before he turned 2. He is almost 13 now. In December, it'll be 11 years with diabetes. My husband has type 2 diabetes, as uh, do other people in my family. And I have a background in broadcasting. I was in radio and TV news for my entire professional career. And that's all the ingredients you need to put together this podcast. I met Derek Thieler. Uh, just about a year ago at a JDRF walk in California. He starred in the show Baby Daddy, which is a long-running comedy on Freeform that used to be ABC Family. It's a very successful show with a big following. You may have seen Derek in a People magazine article. He's been featured for being very open about his type 1 diabetes, and most of the articles that someone probably forwarded to you or you may have seen on Facebook have him with, you know, no shirt on, and he's very open about showing his Dexcom and he's really open about it. And yeah, those pictures, they are something. And uh, as he will tell you, as he talked about in his interview with me, um, it's a big part. His fitness routine is a big part of why he has the job he has now, which is really something of a dream for him. You know, this Marvel universe taking over the world. He plays a big role, a leading role in a new Marvel comedy that will debut early in 2018. It's pretty cool stuff. Uh, Derek and his sister were both diagnosed type 1 as toddlers. And we'll talk about growing up and somebody else in your family. And that was really all they knew. They didn't know anybody else with type 1. So I'm excited to talk to him. I, as I said, I met him last year. And when I first met him, I did a quick interview for a podcast I put out last year. And in the middle of my interview, he was so nice, but they were calling him to the stage. He was one of the people talking and I didn't realize that I was taking his time over the limit and they were yelling for him and he was really trying to wrap up with me and be nice. And of course, I realized it and I was mortified. I said, you know, go, go, go. So yeah, wonderful first impression on my part. Hey, also want to let you know, very important information. Help is still needed in Florida. 
and in Texas because of the hurricanes. You know, we had talked about the help needed specifically in Texas and uh, the people on the ground there, the front lines, who held it together until the bigger organizations could come in. And, you know, that's happening in Florida still and in Texas still, frankly, as the power comes on and, and people go home and find what they have and what they don't have. So I'm continuing in the show notes to list resources, ways you can donate. If you need help, people you can contact contact. It's Diabetes Connections on Facebook, and we've been posting there as well uh, messages of help and, and how you can get resources. So please continue to follow that. A shout out to all the organizations who are helping, and, and we talk about the big ones, of course, JDRF, American Diabetes Association, Insulin for Life, uh, and Project Blue November. You may not be as familiar with them, but they are part of that coordination. Um, Insulin for Life has been the clearinghouse for getting money, getting supplies, and then uh, distributed throughout Texas and in Louisiana, too, and in Florida. Eli Lilly and Company Foundation uh, is donating money, I believe more than a half a million dollars at this point, supporting the American Red Cross and Direct Relief International. And they've also donated more than 10,000 vials of insulin and other diabetes products. There's information as well about getting a new 30-day supply of insulin at no charge. So I'll put that information in the show notes as well. You can go to diabetes-connections.com to see that or wherever you're listening in a podcast app or in our app, there is information about the show. Those are the show notes. So please make sure to check it out because this is an ongoing effort. Unfortunately, the help is going to be needed for a while longer. And I'm working on a show when things do calm down a little bit about lessons learned. What can we do as individuals who need these resources to better prepare for an emergency? And what do the organizations learn about helping those in need? So I will keep you posted on that. Quick word word about Animus, our sponsor for the show, one of our sponsors. I love working with Animus. And after more than 10 years, I love Benny's Animus Insulin Pump. I'm so lucky to have a, a core group of people here in the Charlotte area. We meet up every couple of weeks. And it was so great to hear at the most recent breakfast that we had why so many of you love the Animus experience as well. They offer a choice of insulin pumps, so you can choose the one that's right for you or your child. And with kids, it is great that the Animus pumps really fit an active life. I love talking about our experience with Animus. They make it easy with great products and incredible customer service. To find out more about Animus, just go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Animus, part of the One Touch family logo. A couple of weeks ago, I did a bonus episode protesting the high cost of insulin. It was an interview with Elizabeth Rowley, who heads up T1 International. They organized a protest, a demonstration in front of Eli Lilly and Company at the corporate headquarters on September 9th in Indianapolis. There was an online day of action as well on September 8th. And I just wanted to follow up on that because it got some national attention and made the front page of USA Today. And I'll link up that article so you can see it as well, which is more about the issue. But Diabetes Mine did a great article there. Mike Hoskins was there at the protest and he, I'll link this up as well. And Mike acknowledges that it was a, it was a small protest to a couple dozen people, maybe, but that this, this in-person protest was probably the most visible, as he writes, grassroots action of its kind on insulin prices to date. This is the first time I can remember a protest, an in-person people showing up, uh, bullhorns and signs, uh, to protest pricing in the diabetes community. And they made their voices heard. As I said, they got national attention, a lot of TV coverage in the Indianapolis area as well. And I wonder now if it'll be a first step in keeping this news alive or what will happen. You know, it's really hard to maintain this kind of energy, but it is so important. And yeah, I hear you saying, but Stacey, you just said Lily was great and they gave money to the hurricane victims. You know, they're, they're helping out. Well, that's fine. That's wonderful. And, and there's nothing wrong with doing that. There's nothing wrong with acknowledging when companies do good. But this pricing issue, and you can go back and, and we've talked about this before, it's out of control. It's not just Lilly. There are three insulin companies. There are lots of pharmacy benefit managers. Uh, it's a complicated issue. We, we've, we've done shows on it before. We will do more again. But I do think that T1 International has done a phenomenal job of making this very complex issue more simple, giving people the tools they need to understand it better, and to give a voice to those of us who feel very frustrated. Even if we could afford insulin right now, I have great insurance. We're doing fine. But it, it makes me angry. It makes me worry. How is my son going to pursue a dream career if he's got to worry every month about paying for 
insulin that's that has a crazy inflated price. You know, this doesn't happen with blood pressure medication. This doesn't happen with companies that are allowed to have generics. There is no generic insulin. All right, anyway, so we've done the soapbox thing before, and I know I'll talk about it again, but I just wanted to bring that protest to your attention, and there is all sorts of information linked up in the show notes as well. Derek Thieler coming up, and we do talk about Dexcom. I should note that, well, of course, Dexcom is a sponsor on our show. Derek also speaks for Dexcom. You may have seen him in a Facebook commercial that's going around right now for Dexcom. It's very cute. And uh, we do have a mutual admiration society for that device. But, you know, when Benny was younger, he was totally out there sharing about his diabetes. It didn't mind checking or dosing in class during sports anywhere. But like a lot of middle school kids, he's getting more private. And I was surprised to see how much the Dexcom is helping with that. Being able to discreetly check the display on his smart device or the Dexcom receiver is a lot less cumbersome than getting out all the gear to finger stick. The Dexcom G5 mobile continuous glucose monitoring system is the first FDA-approved device to let you make treatment decisions without pricking your finger. CGM-based treatment requires finger sticks for calibration, may result in hypoglycemia if calibration not performed, or symptoms expectations do not match CGM readings. For more information, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. My guest this week will be starring in the newest addition to the comic book media universe. Derek Thieler is part of Marvel's New Warriors, a new show. It's debuting next year. Now, I first talked to Derek. I met him um, a year ago, almost a year ago now. I met him out in California at a JDRF walk, and I almost made him late for his big speech on the stage. So great first impression. But Derek was diagnosed with type 1 at age 3, and he's already had a very successful acting career. He starred in the Freeform uh, channel show Baby Daddy, and that network used to be called ABC Family. Um, Baby Daddy was its longest running and highest rated comedy. So let's get to it. Derek, welcome back to Diabetes Connections. It's great to talk to you. Oh, great to talk to you. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, yeah. You don't have any like speech to give right now, do you? We have a little bit of time. Yeah, that was funny. That's a, that's a really funny note. The first time I did meet you, they were they were calling my name up on stage. I felt like the whole crowd was staring at me. And I was like, <laughs> oh, crap, I got to get up there. Yeah, it was a great moment for me, too. Yeah. <laughs> well, I appreciate you coming back on. Let's talk a little bit before we talk Marvel and television and all this great stuff. It's so exciting. Um, <laughs> and before we even talk about diabetes, when did you know you wanted to be an actor? When did this start? Was it something since you were a kid or later on? Yeah, it was it was definitely later on for me. I wasn't um I wasn't taking, you know, theater classes when I was growing up. I was always an athlete. And um it's it's kind of crazy. I, I kind of fell into this late, I feel like, as as compared to most people who are actors. But I yeah, I got my degree in Colorado State for pre pre medicine basically. I got my degree in sports medicine and nutrition because I wanted to go into endocrinology. That was the plan. And then my my senior year of school, I took a vacation to Los Angeles, and I met some actors and some producers and some people in the business. And I always loved action movies growing up. So uh, that's kind of when I made my decision my senior year of college that I was going to move to L.A. and drop what I was doing and, and try to become a superhero. That was where, where it all started <laughs> because I knew that they had they were slated for Thor and Captain America and all these like amazing Marvel movies. Iron Man had come out. And that's uh, that's where I thought I, I I fit in, and that was was the job for me. And I uh, I think I'm really lucky I made that decision back then. Wait a second, you really decided to become an actor as part of the superhero movie phase, and and you know the craze that started about that time, and now you are actually in one of these things. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's the, my my goal from the second I decided I was going to come to L.A. was to work for Marvel. That's fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's like I, I don't even know what's next for me now. You know, I got to create a whole new list of goals because I, I got to I, I accomplished the one thing that I came out here to do. And I'm, I'm really happy about it. Wow, that's great. And I'm I cannot wait to talk to you more about that. I'm a big Marvel fan myself. But OK, so you are going to be an endocrinologist. This was something I assume you have type one, as you shared with me last year. Your younger sister does as well. Was that one of the reasons why you went into sports medicine? Um, yeah, yeah. I I was always really interested with the human body and biology was always something I excelled at. And then, um, you know, had, growing up with diabetes and being responsible and just learning about what's going on with my body was really important and really interesting to me. So that's, uh, I think, what kind of influenced me to want to get my degree in that field. 
And then, um, you know, I, I wound up changing my mind, but I still feel like I learned a really, a lot of really great lessons going through school and working so hard on getting my degree, even though I'm currently not using any of it. Well, you probably use some of it though, day to day with diabetes, don't you think? Yeah, that's fair to say for sure. But as far as my career though, I, uh, I'm, I'm kind of on the, on the opposite side, I think. <laughs> so you were diagnosed at age three. I'm not going to ask you if you remember anything about it, but wasn't your sister was diagnosed at that age as well. Do you remember uh, anything about her diagnosis? Yeah, that was actually my very first memory, I believe. Mm. Um, I, was, I was five years old. My sister was three. And uh, we used my blood test kit to check her, her blood sugar. And I remember my, my parents just breaking down and me being so young and not quite able to understand what was happening, but it was such a sad day and seeing my parents in, in that state was a really emotional moment for me. And I think it really was the first thing I remember. Wow. I can't imagine. It's tough. I mean, I have one child with type one. It's difficult to imagine the emotions you must go through, especially two kids so little. But for the two of you, you kind of grew up doing all of this together. Did you, uh, listen, every family is different. Did you share the experience? Did you kind of help each other out? Did you needle each other about it? How did it go? Yeah, honestly, I don't know how I would have done it without her. Uh, my sister, Ashley, like she, her, her and I were always kind of in it together. We didn't know anyone else who had type one diabetes. We didn't have any friends who had type one diabetes, but there was nobody, there were, there were no actors that we were aware of that talked openly about diabetes. So it was her and I, and I remember several times like going through school together, we'd have to share supplies if we ran out of something or, or we would have to help each other out if one of us got low because some of our friends weren't aware of, you know, how to handle the situation. And I really think that it was, um, it was comforting to, to know that we were in it together. Oh, that's fantastic. And, and for perspective, uh, if you don't mind, you're, you're about 30, right? So this was about yes. 27 years ago, 25 years ago for your, your sister. Yep, Something like that's that. right. Okay. All right. I'm just, you know, just for perspective, because I feel like even just in the last 10 years since my son was diagnosed with social media and people being more open about everything there, as you say, there are actors who are, are talking about this like you. There are people on social media we can find and look to. But even 10 years ago, it was a struggle to find other people locally or, or you know, nationally to look up to, um, you know, who had type one and were very open about it. Do you remember any time where you kind of found somebody else, did it take until recently? I'm, I'm trying to think who would have been in your in your generation. Yeah, well, in, in in talking on that point, that is one of my missions for sure is to be as open as I can about having diabetes. And as I you know try to build a following and work through my career, I, I really want to be someone that uh, type one diabetics can relate to and someone that they can see you know going after their dreams no matter what the obstacles are. And um, that's very important to me because I feel like I didn't have that as a kid. Well, one of the things that I, I remember reading about you, and maybe it was last year in People magazine or something, they talked about the restrictions you had as a kid, you know, no sleepovers and being mm -hmm. um, very careful about what you were eating, which seemed a little bit more restrictive than what most kids do. Well, I'll be honest with you. It seems a lot more restrictive than what many kids go through now. Was yeah, that well, because I, of the think... routine you had? I think part of it's uh, also the technology. Like there's mm. so many great devices these days that make managing diabetes a lot easier. And when I was a little kid, I started giving my own injections when I was six years old and kind of regulating it myself. But I didn't get a pump until I was 15 or 16. Mm -hmm. And I, I just feel like we didn't have a community. We didn't have a diabetic community. Touching on that last point, too, I, I didn't even have any friends who were diabetic until I found this summer camp that uh, was, you know, diabetics only for a week. And then I had my pen pal buddies, but those were kind of the only people. I didn't have anyone else in my, in my school besides my sister. So um, maybe it was a little bit strict of a routine, but it honestly, it was, uh, it was, it was challenging. It, it felt like I had a whole lot of responsibility as far as, you know, being a kid and being able to enjoy your friend's birthday parties and drink regular soda and eat birthday cake oh and, gosh. and stay up super late. Those were all things that I couldn't do or was taught not to because of diabetes. Well, sure. And it's, as I as I already said, it's easy to forget how much it's changed just in the last 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. I love that you talk about diabetes camp and pen pals, which is something that I don't know if my kids would even know what that is. Yeah, but, it's, yeah <laughs> times have changed. We used to write these things called letters. Where did you go to camp? Would you mind sharing some of that? It was in Colorado where I grew up, somewhere like way up in the mountains. And uh, it, it was such a great experience for me. And I, I suggest uh, parents of type 1 diabetics or, or kids alike 
if you want to meet more people and, and create a community that, that are going through the same obstacles, going to a diabetic camp is amazing. We, they had like a nurse for every cabin and there was time for everyone to check their blood sugar like every couple of hours. It was it was really nice to be surrounded by both people who were aware and knowledgeable and also had the disease. Yeah, I love diabetes camp. I mean, it's something that I'll obviously never experience, but it's it's done yeah. so much for my son. It's just a great thing. And you played a lot of sports. Can you talk uh, about yeah. how you incorporated that again? You didn't have all the tools in the community that we have now. Yeah, I played uh, football and basketball growing up. Uh, basketball was like a huge part of my life in the summers, and it was kind of what I, you know, what I focused on when I was younger. And um, I remember my, my dad was so proud of himself uh, when I was playing football that he found a way to cut out um, a huge section of my pad and my quad to fit my pumping so I wouldn't have to disconnect for the games and stuff. So that, that that's one way I dealt with it. But it, it's challenging. Is it, Anyone who's a parent or, or a type 1 diabetic knows, like, if your blood sugar isn't right in the right range, you cannot perform at your best. And so that was kind of a struggle throughout the, the years trying to make sure that I was prepared for game time because uh, ups and downs, you know, you know it, it's it's hard. It's hard to stay straight. Tell me a little bit, if I could be really nosy, about how your dad did that, because I know I'm going to hear from football parents. You know, there's yeah, a lot of kids uh, wearing pumps playing sports, and they figure out, put them between the pads or the shoulders or the, ch- you know, how do you do that? Right. Well, this this was, uh, again, over 10 years ago, you know, so the pumps were probably twice as big as they are now. But uh, my dad was so proud. He, he, you know, he took he took a knife to one of the, the main quad pads on your on your leg mm-hmm. and cut out a section that was perfect to, for, to fit my pump in, and it just fit right in, and uh yeah, that's how I, uh, I I kept the pump on me when I played. That's great. Yeah, you have to figure it out. I mean, there are some sports where you don't disconnect and some sports maybe where you do. And yep. uh, that's great. So when you went to college, did you continue to play any sports? Yeah, b- basketball was always, mm. uh, you know, really important to me. I, I made friends with all the boys on the team at Colorado State. I I, I dated a girl who was on the team, and I'd play uh, throughout their summer league. I'd play with all the boys. So that was always, you know, really close to my heart, that sport. But um, yeah, that's probably that's the expe- extent of my uh, my, my <laughs> sports career. <laughs> well, then you went to L.A. and all bets were off. But, right, but yeah. if I could stay in college for just a little while longer, I'm curious if you learned things as that kind of pre-med curriculum that you were taking that taught you more about yourself or that you said that's not true. Or, you know, it's always interesting to me how we kind of are our own doctors, Mm-hmm. You know, in the diabetes world, and sometimes what they're teaching doesn't exactly match up, and sometimes it can be like a light bulb going off. Yeah, there weren't a whole lot of times where I didn't believe what I was being taught was true, I guess. But I, um, it was just very interesting to me to understand, like on the molecular level, what's mm-hmm. happening in my body. I mean, with, with my degree, I had to go through organic chemistry and like a couple of years of physics and and math and statistics and. And it was it was a lot. It was really challenging. But I found that I really liked my nutrition classes the most because I could really directly apply that to you know my condition. No, I didn't mean to imply they didn't know what they were doing. I just know that sometimes <laughs> in pre-med, people will take a class on diabetes and it's like, you know, outdated information or something. But, right. Yeah, that's somewhat true because it is these days taught in almost every health class that you have because yeah. it's 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 so common. But um yeah, I, I, I was a, I was a good student, but I also uh, I, I had a lot of fun too. I was in those early college years and and um, experimenting with with a little bit of drinking and stuff like that. And uh, hey, that that's when I had a couple of kind of the scariest moments in my with my diabetes. That I'm kind of glad that I'm I'm through that stage too. Would you mind talking about that because that is something that you know is so concerning about young people in college or young people, as you said, just trying stuff out. Would you mind sharing a little bit more about that? Yeah, I, I didn't have many emergency situations. And I, I, I think it's very important too. another thing that I preach is for diabetics to teach those around them how to handle a low blood sugar and what to do if there is an emergency. And I would always do that for all of my friends, of course. I mean, at this point in my life, I'm not a drinker. I'll, I'll enjoy a couple of drinks. But there was a time where I was trying to figure out, you know, who I was. And, and I was 21 years old. And I, I might have overdone it a couple of times like everybody does or like most people do. Sure. And I definitely I, I remember one night specifically, it was like my 22nd birthday. And of course, it's like the perfect storm. You know, like I I skipped dinner because we didn't have enough time. And then it was my birthday and everyone was buying me drinks and I overdid it. And then my uh, 
my pump, I had just got a new pump and my basal settings were off and it was delivering too much insulin. So I wound up having an extreme low when I woke up in the morning and I, I wouldn't wake up. So my friends had to like break into my door and call an ambulance and they had to come in and, um, you know, they took my blood sugar and I was, I was wow. 19 at the time. Wow. And that was the one really scary moment where I feel like I kind of got my act together after that. And I, I think everyone's got a situation that who's a diabetic where they, they were way too low at one time and they, they felt helpless. And that, that was mine for sure. My mom, you know, hates me telling the story, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I was extremely low and I had some paramedics come and they, they put me on oxygen and like a glucose saline drip and the whole nine yards. And, um, uh, it came out of that kind of realizing how dangerous it can be to, to not keep yourself in control and, and keep the right mindset. So I think it was an important lesson for me. Well, and I, I really applaud you for telling that story because, uh, you know, a lot of parents I talk to say, well, my kid's just not going to drink. And that's mm -hmm. not the case. It's just not, it, you know, it's, it's not so the case. I mean, it might be the case for one kid or two kids, but it's, it's very difficult. I totally agree with you. I mean, and, and another thing that I like to preach is to, to be yourself and do the things you want to do and don't let diabetes, you know, hold you back. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to drinking, it's something you have to be extra responsible for, for sure. And you definitely shouldn't overdo it. That's that's what I believe. But people, the kids are going to be kids and it's it's bound to happen. You know, how did you talk to your friends? How did they know? you know, to come in, to take your, to, they took your blood sugar. I want to give them a hug right now. You know, how did they know yeah. to do all that? Uh, just because I, I felt it was very important to teach the people around me how to handle a situation. And, um, yeah, they broke the frame in my door to get in because my <laughs> alarm was going off. I missed the class and I was not responding to them, you know, yeah. when, when they were banging on the door and then they, they tried to try to wake me up and I wouldn't wake up. And, um, if it wasn't for them, if they could, you know, they could wait another hour with my alarm going off and complaining about, you know, me making noises in the other room. And if they wouldn't have known, it could have been a worse situation than yeah. it was. Yeah, that's right. So I assume that you tell people around you that you're close to, but, and I shouldn't assume anything, but when you went to LA and you started looking for jobs, you're an outspoken person about diabetes now. Was it something you talked about? I can't imagine going on an audition or a job interview and sharing. I mean, I don't share my health conditions. How do you manage that when you're auditioning yeah. and trying to get a job? <laughs> You got to pick the right moment, I yeah. think, for that. I don't think I told most of my bosses right off the bat because, you know, it's somewhat of a liability, especially if people don't know what it is. Yeah. Uh, you don't want to have anything on the negative list, you know? I have a story, too, with the actual audition for Baby Daddy. This is an, another one of those stories that I didn't handle my blood sugar correctly, and I was I was sitting in the waiting room for three hours longer than I thought I would be, oh, and, then, and then I had to go in and work with uh, the director and showrunner for baby daddy before we did the test because there's a very there's a whole lot of steps to booking a lead in a tv show these days and um i was doing this session that went you know way longer than i thought i, I missed lunch i was die uh, my, my blood sugar was was falling rapidly and i basically like melted right in front of them and in my head i didn't want to tell them that i have this condition and um i didn't want to give them any excuses right off the bat because this is the first time that I met these people that, who were going to influence my life so much. So I just tried to kind of fight it. And I was sweating. My whole shirt looked like I just jumped in a pool. <laughs> and I was I was kind of slurring my words because my blood sugar was really low. And I, um, I, I got out of that audition and I, I couldn't find my car. You know, I'm on the Disney lot wandering around like it was really kind of a, a, a low moment because I feel like I had ruined one of the best career opportunities at, at the time. You know, oh. this was four or five years ago. And I got in the car and I called my mom and I was crying. And I, you know, I, at that time I had a couple of power bars and like a Gatorade in my car, you know, of course, when I finally found it and I told her the situation and she said, you have to call that casting director right now and tell them what happened. You have to do it. And I was like, mom, I don't want to give them any excuses. I, I know I didn't do my best. And she's like, you have to do it. So I hung up on the phone with her and I called the casting director and said, I'm really sorry. I don't want to be the guy with excuses, but I, I have a condition. I'm a diabetic and I was having a really bad low today and I definitely wasn't performing my best. And she's like, oh, thank God for telling me. We were so worried about you. We didn't know what was going on, you know, and uh, I should have just come out and said it at the time. But they were worried about me. They thought I could have been on drugs. Oh, like, sure. There, there was a lot of things that, that it, it could have been. And after I told them that, I wound up going in uh, the next day for the test and having a con getting to go in early and having conversation with them and um, and booking the job. Oh, so wow. it's kind of a nice ending to, to that story. But there's another it's a situation that, that can kind of happen no matter how prepared you are for it or not. 
Right. And I'm sure you're not thinking clearly. I mean, not only is your body responding to that low, but your brain's not thinking clearly. Exactly. And there's a lot of stress on you. Yeah. You know, this was my first really big opportunity to be a lead in a TV show. And I, I didn't really understand what was happening to me until I got back to my car and right. took my blood sugar and was like, man, uh, no wonder I'm falling apart right now. And then uh, luckily I did uh, get in contact with them and uh, it all worked out. You know what the lesson is? Listen to your mother. Listen to your mother <laughs> always. Yes, that's that's a good lesson. She must have been thrilled to find out that they not only you know took you back for the test, but when you got the part, that must have been such a great moment for all of you. Yeah, it was. It was an amazing moment for for my family and I. And um, it's funny, like I'm I moved to L.A. without knowing anyone, and my family has no idea what this business is like. And uh, for something like that to happen relatively quickly after I moved here, it was so exciting. That's really great. So what was it like working on that show? I mean, you know, oh, 100 episodes, it's popular, great cast. Was it? I mean, it's work, but is it fun? Oh, it's not work at all. It's all fun. It's a <laughs> blast. It's like going out and hanging out with the, the funniest friends you have on that show. It's so great. Uh, we, we, everything kind of leads up to our Friday night where we have our live audience taping. So um, throughout the week, we're rehearsing, we're pitching jokes, we're blocking, we're, we're you know, just enjoying our days. And then when Friday night hits, we have a 200 person audience roll in and we do all of our stuff that we've been working all week in front of them. And it's a really cool experience. OK, well, I have to go back. What was your first job in L.A.? This wasn't your first job, right? No, I was pretty fortunate with, with this stuff because I, I didn't know much about it. But when I hit the ground in Los Angeles, I wanted to put all my money towards taking acting classes and meeting with coaches and, and working on my craft as fast as I could because I felt like I was an adult. There's so many kids who come out and, mm. and are young and um, they get a head start, I feel like, because they've been taking theater classes at school. And for me, I was like, this was all so new to me. So I, I did that. I took as many meetings as I could to get good representation. And I, I was lucky enough to book several national commercials the first year I was here. So my cheap apartment in, you know, way deep in the valley was, <laughs> was pretty much paid off for the first year uh, through commercials. So I didn't have to get a real job. That's which great. I think really benefited me in moving forward and being able to take those classes and take those meetings and take every single audition that uh, I got. So that's uh, that was basically my start. And then Baby Daddy was like my second really big audition for uh, a real job that wasn't just in commercials. And luckily I got it. That's fantastic. Can you share any of those commercials? I mean, you know, YouTube has everything and the Internet is forever. So if it's too embarrassing, you don't have to share Oh, there's a couple of pretty embarrassing ones, but I'm actually kind of proud of, of several of them, too. I did a, a State Farm commercial where I kept reappearing as a different guy, like with different traits <laughs> that uh, I was really proud of. And that was probably my, my most watched or most lucrative commercial. And then um, I did one for Kayak.com, the, uh, the flight booking mm -hmm. website where I was like a masseuse and just massaging a woman the whole time. And uh, I did one for Nike. I did one for I did one for Arby's or oh, wow. no, what? Yeah, I did one for Arby's, but I got cut out of the commercial, but I, I had to eat like 25 <laughs> chicken sandwiches this one day, and I, I was excited that I booked it. It was like this whole big spot, and I was supposed to be a weightlifter, and you know, it's like, uh, I crammed my face with these chicken sandwiches, protein, bro, you know, and then I got to eat the sandwich, and I wound up eating 20 sandwiches in the day, and then they cut me from the commercial, but that's just kind of what it's like. That's how what it's like in this business. <laughs> That's awesome. Did you bolus for every single one? Like, how do you do <laughs> yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. I was taking a lot of insulin that day. <laughs> That's great. And so take us through this process. I mean, is this something where you had to audition a bunch of times? Did they, is, I don't know if this is even polite to ask, um, but, you know, how do you get this Marvel Universe role is amazing. Everybody's talking about Squirrel Girl, but, yeah. you know, this is a big show, lots of attention already. How'd you find out you got the part? Maybe we'll just fast forward to that. Yeah, uh, the thing is, um, I, I've, it's, it's for the same network that Baby Daddy was on. Right. And um, I, uh, I've got a friendly relationship with a couple of the execs there. And I, I wound up at Comic Con, New York Comic Con a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a, a dinner with one of the execs at Freeform. And we were just friendly talking about our future and, and things. And she asked me what I really wanted to do next after Baby Daddy. And what I told her is, I want to do a TV show for Marvel. That's what I want to do. Uh -huh. That's what I've got my sights set on. Like, that's my dream job is to be a comic book superhero. And from that conversation, I, I guess she remembered that. And the show started developing a couple of properties with Marvel. And then this wound up 
fitting in perfectly like three months after baby daddy got ended this uh this one came up and i guess i was right for the role and i was very excited about it and i and i met with marvel about it and um ended up auditioning and, and luckily getting the part and I'm, I'm so excited for everyone to see it next year who was the first person you called when you found out you got it um my mom of course <laughs> it, my, my parents yeah my, my i'm very close with my, my family and my parents and and it, it was kind of a long uh a thing too it was something that i had heard rumors about like there's like a, a code name that's attached to the property that, that i don't think i can tell you what it is sure. but it's like it's um it's something that I've been aware of for for months and really really wanted a shot at and didn't know if the timing was going to work out and as soon as it did and I got the call from the execs at Marvel and their first words were uh welcome to Marvel oh. and that was kind of the moment it was like that's the phrase that I've been waiting to hear since I landed in LA so it was a really awesome moment uh, in that to that question, that leads me to something I wanted to ask it back to your sister and your family. Mm-hmm. When, you know, I'm trying to imagine Thanksgiving at your house because you said, or, you know, just family get togethers. You said they're not in the, they're not in show business and mm-hmm. they don't probably don't really care. You know, they're not going to be impressed that you are. Does your sister yeah. still give you like ugh, a lot of grief about things? Does she still tease you? Are you guys close? Uh, oh yeah, we're very close. And yeah, it's like, they're excited for me oh, in sure. success, of course, but they don't really get it. If I'm going, like, I'm going to the Guardians of the Galaxy two premiere, and I've never been more excited for anything. And they're like, "Oh, they're making another one of those." Okay, you know, like it's <laughs> it's pretty funny. So the it, the, the kind of levels of things that are important are a little bit different. Like my my sister, you know, she just had her first baby, oh, and he's good. he was extremely premature. So there's they've got a lot of complications with that. But he's he's doing all right now. Good, good. But you know, it's like this kind of stuff just isn't that important to them. And I understand that, but um, it's fun to kind of get razzed by him every once in a while too. Well, family is supposed to do is that we smack you in the back of the head and say go make your bed sit down who cares exactly yeah exactly. oh that's, that's great. exactly what it's like i hope your nephew's and, and, doing and, okay yeah he's doing all right i all mean right, it's good. just it's been it's been a long uh, long year for him but he's doing okay so you talked about auditioning and not really trying to talk about diabetes too much which makes sense can i ask you you know do you do you talk about it do other people ask you about it in hollywood when you go to events i mean you've been very public about it has anybody ever mentioned it to you yeah, yeah, they do. Um, it's funny. The, the diabetic community is so great. And um, I do have the occasional fan who comes up to me and says, oh, I, I'm a diabetic, you know, and and we have the same pump or, or I have a Dexcom. And I, I love talking to people about it because I, I feel like it's it's kind of the community that, that I didn't have when I was growing up. I didn't have somebody who was working on things that I liked or that I was a fan of that had diabetes. So I, I love talking to people about it if they come up to me on the street. And I also love talking to people about um, the treatment options. If I run into someone who's a diabetic and ask them if they have a CGM and if they don't, I like to tell them about it, about, about Dexcom and how it's changed my life. So that's that's something else that's, that's uh, interesting to me and, and fun to talk about. Well, and let's talk about that because, I mean, you're part of the Dexcom program, uh, the Warrior program, I believe. I'm a, yeah. they sponsored the podcast, so no fooling around here, but we do that because we love it. How did Dexcom change your life? What brought you to yeah, that? It's, it's, it's a little bit of a long story. I'll get it started. Um, my, <laughs> my sister was trying to get pregnant, and she uh, her endo told her to go go for a CGM. She got a Dexcom. It really helped her you know, bring her A1C down and, and keep her levels right. So she convinced me to try it. And then after I tried it for a couple of months, I, I, I couldn't imagine not having it. It's it's so great because you know it's, a, it, it's not just a shot when you take your blood test. It's just like a quick picture of where your blood sugar is but when you have the dexcom it, it lets you know whether it's going up or down and how fast it's moving and which you know how long it's been high or low or whatever so i really believed in this product i and and i loved it and i told all my friends about it before i partnered with them and um, now that i'm working with them it, i i'm really excited to be in this position where i i you know i get to shoot these commercials at my house for dexcom and i i get to influence you know their marketing and um, it's it's really like a dream partnership for me to be working with such an amazing company that's really changed my life. That's wonderful to hear. Did it ever go off on set? Has it like do you change your alarms? You must quiet everything. Oh, uh, yeah. My my alarms are all vibrates because, yeah, it's I that's that's one thing working on a set you need to know is you can't have a phone going off while the cameras are rolling. Yeah, we've been big fans of it just because, and my son would kill me, but 12 years old is a tough time for anybody, and 
the hormone stuff is crazy. So mm. just the last year, it's been like you know up and down, and and without the Dexcom, I, I think it would be much more difficult. So that's oh, been yeah, so me. helpful. Most definitely, and also for uh, for parents um, like you, or even with younger children, mm-hmm. when they're going when they're going to school and they're they're not you know, when you're not close to them, you can at least know exactly where they are and contact the people who are close to them if there's any kind of a problem. Do you use the Dexcom share? And again, if, you, if it's too personal, don't let, you know, you don't have to share. You don't have to share. But do you share <laughs> with your parents? Do you let other people, you know, is that something that you yep. use? My, my mom is always connected to my Dexcom share. And um, also uh, my, my girlfriend is on it as well. So it's like I'm, I'm getting motherly advice from <laughs> two women um, whenever my blood's out of range. It's funny. <laughs> That is funny. Did you have to have a conversation? I assume it's kind of two different conversations with them about, you know, call me here or don't because I have a whole system with my son because oh, yeah. I don't want him to burn out. So I'm like, I'll call you at this point, but I won't bother you if it's this, you know, we have an agreement. Yeah. And, and I think that's smart for sure. And uh, I, yeah, I've got an agreement too. You know, if there's a certain level that if it it's, doesn't get below, you don't need to to call the PA on set <laughs> and make sure that I'm still alive because there's plenty of people around, me. you know. <laughs> All right. Another really nosy question, but I I have to ask. You mentioned your girlfriend. I don't have this issue because my son is young, although I know it's coming. Dating with diabetes. Do you tell people? I mean, I can't imagine you ask people on a date and then you're like, hey, by the way, let me show you my Dexcom. But how do you You, handle that? You know what? I went through a stage where I was really embarrassed about it because that's just the way teenagers and young adults are. They, They don't want something unnatural or something that seems, you know, different uh, to, to be attached to their body. But it did this stage of my life. I, um, and I, I feel like this is also a mentality that anyone can use is I feel like I'm as close as you can get to like a cyborg. Like I'm a Terminator, basically. <laughs> I've got these machines attached to my body. I'm as close as you could be to like Stony, Tony Stark or a superhero because, um, without these machines, I, I can't really function normally. And that's something that I like to address in that way that I, that I really am like kind of like a superhero slash cyborg <laughs> slash a machine. And I just kind of laugh it off and introduce it that way. And then if they want to see what it looks like, you know, if, if we're that close, then then that, that's where you go from there. My son will tell people, sometimes he'll actually tell them what it is. But most of the time he says, I'm ready for Skynet. You need to get yeah. one of these. Like, it's time. Yes. The robots are coming. Exactly. So. Terminator reference. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. <laughs> Um, I did have a couple of questions from my listeners who wanted to know if you would mind sharing if you have help with your, how did they put this, in terms of eating and working out. You know, mm-hmm. do you, how do you stay in good shape and eat right without a lot of lows and highs? And Jennifer wrote, I like this, I feel like actors must have cooks and personal trainers. Is there a secret? Well, actors do have cooks and personal trainers, but me personally, I don't have that. I wish I did, I guess, but I, um, yeah, I, I just, I've been working out. I, and sports have been so important to me growing up that I feel like I, I understand my body and, and how to, you know, to work out, to try to look my best because it's part of my job. So I try to, you know, get to the gym and I also try to eat right. And it's just something that's kind of been ingrained in me since the beginning is responsibility and eating right and taking care of yourself because I feel like, Time is the the most precious commodity, and uh, the more you, the more good time you have, the uh, the more fulfilling and better your life can be. So that's kind of the way I look at it. But as far as having those people influencing me, I, I don't have a cook or a trainer. I do it all on my own. Do you have a certain style of eating? I know a lot of people try a lot of different ways. Yeah, is- eating habits for me, I really like uh, like the paleo diet, the caveman diet. I I try not to eat a lot of bread or pasta. I eat meat with every meal, vegetables, fruits, uh, you know, rice, stuff like that. That's my uh, my main diet plan is stay away from uh, big like carbs, like bread and, and pasta. Okay. Um, and then another question, and a couple of people asked this, is have you learned anything about yourself through diabetes? Kind of a heavy question. Yeah. Have I learned anything about myself? I mean, you were diagnosed when you were three. I think that that's the kind of question that almost is easier if you're diagnosed as an adult because you've always been. You've always had type one. Yeah, I, I I can't imagine having a life without this. You know, I it's it's just constant for me. Um, and I feel like I have learned a lot. I I feel like as far as being a responsible child and and having something that you had to handle no matter what the stakes, no matter what the situation is, you have to handle a low blood sugar first thing. And that was something that I think going through my childhood, it made me more responsible throughout and. I, I feel like I'm a more responsible adult now. 
Do you go to diabetes camps? Is that something you've been involved with as an adult? Have you gone back? It's not as an adult. No, I haven't. I, I'm interested. The problem is um, I'm so busy. Yeah. I'm either, you know, filming or I'm traveling somewhere else in the country promoting something or or doing a partnership or something. But um, diabetes camps, like like we mentioned, like it was a big part of, of my summer, my childhood summer. It was and it's something I would be interested in going back and maybe speaking at or something. That's cool. Is there um, is there anything that you wanted to mention that I may have missed? I want to uh, make sure that, that type 1 diabetics are aware of all their treatment options and all the new technologies because I feel like the sooner you get with the, the new stuff, the sooner, you know, the, the, the more it's going to evolve and I think the better it will get. I also want to build a community of that type 1 diabetics. I want people who are in the limelight, who have any kind of a following to, to be comfortable talking about it and, and sharing about their life struggles just like everybody else. And I also want type ones to believe that they can achieve all of their goals, no matter how high they are and, and not let diabetes hold them back at all. Those are, those are my three main missions. Wonderful. Thanks so much for joining me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Stacy. You're listening to diabetes connections with Stacy Sims. Marvel's New Warriors is set to air in early 2018, and we'll have more with Derek about the show at that time. And of course, more information on him. And I'm going to put some of those commercials he mentioned. I found them. So I will put them on Facebook. I'm going to try to put them as a preview, so you may have already seen them if you follow us on Facebook. But if you are new or haven't clicked around yet, definitely check it out because the commercials that he mentioned, the massage for kayak and what was the other one? Oh, the um, the State Farm one is hysterical. That's a really good one. So we'll follow up with Derek when the show is set to air. Um, but he's so much fun to talk to. I really appreciate him spending some time with me. So I started Shop Talk this new Shop Talk segment, because there are so many terrific companies and groups that you can learn about at diabetes conferences. But if you can't get to the big ones, it's hard to find out about them, right? If you can't go to the conference, you can't walk around the vendor floor. So today, I want you to hear from two great organizations. And by the way, all of these interviews were recorded at an actual conference on an actual open vendor floor. So there's a lot of background noise. You can hear just fine, but I just want to let you know it's there. But let's start with Connected in Motion. This is a group that's all about diabetes education through adventure and fun activities. It's a Canadian group, but they do a lot here in the U.S. Here are Amy Burroughs and Becky Marvel. We do adventure-based programming for adults mainly with type 1 diabetes. We do do some programming with teens as well. But yeah, adventure-based and it's ex essentially experiential education. So we're learning from one another as we're doing cool stuff like canoe trips and hiking trips and... Um, weekend kind of weekend kind of diabetes um, camps for adults as well. We do that with some education component and then some activities as well. Yeah, tell me a little bit more about adventure because you started to say what types of things you do. Yeah, so um, last year Amy and I were part of the first kind of epic adventure that uh, Connected Motion did, which was a four-day three-night camping trip in the outback in Grossmore National Park in Newfoundland. So there was um, about a dozen of us and we had type 1 diabetes. We carried a third of our weight on our back and we packed through um, and, you know, pitched tents, uh, carried the food, uh, managed our diabetes and kind of got each other through this really Mm, intense. vigorous, intense <laughs> hike. And so that's the kind of adventure, that's kind of the more extreme types of adventures that are possible. But there's also much lighter activities that people can participate in and just start to get their feet wet when it comes to being outdoors, challenging themselves um, with diabetes. Why would yeah. you do all that? <laughs> we we like to, A, I guess, um, help to show other people with type 1 diabetes that you can do anything you would like to do with diabetes and we can help create these comfort zones for you. And uh, if your comfort zone is going on an overnight canoe trip or even car camping and you just want to learn to set up a tent and that's your comfort zone, great. We can help uh, set you up with something like that. If your comfort zone is doing like something like Becky and I did and you want to push it and do a 35 kilometer hike through a mountain range uh, that has an unmarked trail and you have to navigate the whole entire way with compass and map, cool. We can help uh, do that as well. Uh, but it's to try and kind of motivate people and inspire people. 
happy. So our, our teen um, stuff we're kind of branching out on now is uh, teenagers that are in that transitioning age. So as they're leaving pediatric care to adult care, uh, we kind of want to bridge that gap and, and let them know, hey, once you're done the you know kid stuff, there is a support system out there for you. There is this safety net of people who also have type 1 and who get it. Like, get it. You can't see the air quotes on the podcast. <laughs> but <laughs> And and so we, we run a series of canoe trips uh, and they're called our uh, transition canoe trips. That's up in Canada. We're also running uh, day programs and weekend programs in the United States. And we're always looking out to people. If you are the face of diabetes in your community and you want to set up something cool, like maybe an afternoon bike ride, or you guys want to go into rock climbing or something like that, uh, Connect and Emotion will always be there as your support system and to get word out and, and to help you organize something like that. So if that's something that you want to do in like the teenage, absolutely, we can, uh, the teenage range, I should mm-hmm. say, <laughs> we can, we can help facilitate that as well in the u.s as well yes u.s as well absolutely yeah, yeah. Sure. has this helped you absolutely um last year after doing the hike i felt incredibly empowered you know days after the hike you'd think i'd be exhausted and want to lay down but i was like no i'm gonna bike 60 kilometers this weekend i'm gonna do like i just felt like i could do anything literally anything and um the friendships that we made in those you know very short period of time were incredibly intense and we we do stay well connected now and that's a great emotional support which is really needed in a chronic disease world you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> same with you yeah, oh, unbelievably. <laughs> I've, uh, I started off at summer camp when I was eight years old. I'll be 33 this year, and I have clearly not given up on the whole idea of having a diabetes community. Uh, like Becky said, the, the emotional support is invaluable. It, it is something that I cherish so much. Uh, to be able to even text somebody who has type 1 at like 2 in the morning and be like, I've tried everything. My blood sugars are not coming down. Mm-hmm. They might be able to pull something out of their backpack and be like, I've tried this before. Have you tried it? And that's the whole basis of experiential education. But just the support, the it, being around people who get it and who understand mm-hmm. <laughs> is unbelievable. And we get to do really cool stuff. More on Connected in Motion at diabetes-connections.com or, of course, in the show notes. Next on Shop Talk, meet the couple behind Pump Peels. These are those cool stickers you can put on your diabetes devices. Uh, they have everything from you know fireworks and Pokemon. And uh, as you'll hear, they, they take their patterns from what's popular and what people have asked for. It's pretty cool stuff. Emily Emblem and her husband, Scott, started the company after her diagnosis in college. Now it is a full-fledged business and they are looking to branch out. We make medical devices for diabetes more fun and more interesting. Some of them are kind of drab looking. So we like people to first notice that it looks great rather than saying, hey, what is that that you're wearing? So I'm type 1 diabetic, and we developed this company five years ago to just make diabetes more fun. How do you come up with the patterns? It's kind of a a combination of things. I notice what's popular from designs uh, that I see on patterns at stores, um, on clothing, on purses. So we take inspiration from that. And then we also have customers send requests. They'll say, hey, um, I really want pineapples or a certain thing. So if we get enough requests, then we realize, oh, pineapples are really popular and really in demand. <laughs> so uh, it's a combination of customer input and then just design inspiration from other places. Was there a moment for you when you realized, you know, my CGM, my pump really are drab? I mean, because you're a user of these. Is there a, a moment where you thought, this has got to be better? So the first moment was I went on the Omnipod. That was my first pump. And uh, in the process of researching insulin pumps, we noticed that kids were just putting a sheet of stickers, those kind of stickers on their pumps to make them look better. And uh, we were studying kind of the creative field in college. And we thought, oh, we can totally come up with products that are custom fit and look great for all kinds of insulin pumps. But the Omnipod was our first inspiration because it's just a white I don't want to say blob, but, you know, just a white piece of uh, plastic on your arm or on your body. We never anticipated to be here by any means. Um, We started fresh out. Actually, the process began in college still while I was diagnosed. I was 21, so it began shortly after that. And we just did it as a hobby and just something fun to do to kind of give back to the community, something that we knew we could do, so we felt obligated to do it. And then kind of over the last five years, it has grown organically. And we have quit both of our jobs, and we do this full-time, and we just recently hired two employees as well. Our ultimate hope is that 
we get a cure. And then we move into other areas of the medical field with our products. That would be the dream. We always joked that uh, we want to go out of business someday. But our hope is just to branch out of diabetes, continue moving forward in diabetes as it progresses and as the technology gets better, um, but to branch out and help other people in the medical, that are using medical devices as well. You sure. know, there's a lot of excitement over your booth. You know, people are like, oh my gosh, look, look when I found the Pokemon. Yeah. <laughs> What's that like for you when you realize it, it does matter to people? It's the best because we're an online business. So we send out these products all over the world and, um, Often we don't see the end result or we don't get to interact with the customers and see the excitement of, oh, wow, I found something great. So getting to be here and see the faces and the excitement and the enthusiasm and just the, the joy that this brings is this is what it was all about for us. And this is why we started it. So it brings a full circle to be here. That is a popular booth because they had samples. As you heard, I snagged a Pokemon sticker for Benny's Dexcom. And now he's looking for the matching, you know, pump, actual pump peel. You can find out more about pump peels and everything we talked about on the show at the website, diabetes-connections.com. I mentioned listening on a podcast app. Really the easiest way to listen to the show on your phone or your mobile device is to get our app. Search for Diabetes Connections in the App Store, Apple or Android. I have an app. It's very easy to use and you can text episodes to friends and family. Very easy to share. And if you have the app, you make sure you'll you'll never miss an episode. It will load up and be ready for you every Tuesday when we debut the new episode. So I hope that helps out. And if you're listening on social media, that's great. I, I hope I make it easy for you to find, but it's difficult to get the show notes that way. So if you want more information, please make sure to visit the website or ping me and we can get you more. All right, big show today. Lots of information. If you have any questions, please let me know. If you have any feedback, I'm always happy to hear from you. Stacy at diabetes-connections.com, S-T-A-C-E-Y at diabetes-connections.com. Big thanks to my editor, to John Buchanan at Audio Editing Solutions, who always makes me sound better than I have any right to be. Thank you, John. I know how valuable your time is. It is a thrill to spend this hour with you each week, you know, just to spend that hour with people who get it. I hope it helps you. It definitely helps me. And I love telling these stories. I'm Stacey Sims. I'll see you back here next week. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.